welcome to the Opera Conversations podcast. Uh, my name is Damien. And my name is Kieran. And today our guest was Robbie Butler from the UUP. Uh, really interesting, very friendly guy. Decent sense of humor too, actually. Um, so what kind of struck me about this podcast is, yeah, we covered a range of topics, but particularly his fostering uh, of kids, him and his wife, who I believe had fostered uh, around 40 kids. Um, and how that impacted on his on his life is really really interesting yeah they fostered a huge amount of children over the years and we'll probably speak to very few people who've had as vastly different career as Robbie Butler he's worked as a butcher and he's worked in the prison service and the fire brigade and now as a member of the Ulster Unionist Party so the career changes he's had has been huge and he's got a lot of interesting stories from all of that yeah um we, we think you really enjoy this podcast so have a listen enjoy if there's anyone else you'd like us to interview or to have on the podcast uh, please comment in the section below please hit us a like and, and please share this podcast so more people get to see it thanks for coming on yeah look um we have been kind of trolling through politicians we'd be really interested in talking to and you were definitely very high up in our list <laughs> almost more so because of your personal life rather than um like your political life because your personal life is very interesting um that's well, a that's a backhanded insult there demo <laughs> is it is it really no, I, I don't mean it like that. <laughs> I, I can I'll try that on my, my election literature when I go around don't ask me about policies just ask me about the person <laughs> the person it'd, be, it'd actually it'd be quite good to get people to vote actually for a person that uh, well and so I'm, so I'm, I'm actually I'm probably reaching in too far and suggesting that there's good stu- some good stuff in there that you liked, but it would it is probably good to try to encourage people to, to look beyond the politics, sometimes the policy, and, and see the person and see if they can like uh, or connect with uh, or trust the person, I suppose. 100%. Who's the soundest on the ballot paper? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or as young people, who's the goat? Yeah. <laughs> who's the goat? <laughs> Yeah, like I often like we're very much into this idea of these are our entrenched camps here in Northern Ireland. And, you know who's the enemy, and you know, like like it's crazy to even think of another another side of the community as an enemy. When really, if you knew them as people, I think that kind of language would die down and would be able to get a lot more done. One hundred percent. Um. Yeah. So I, I was very curious to ask you about um the fact uh, you're your family are, are very big into fostering um, kids. And am I right in saying you fostered up to close to 40 kids Is that so far? Is that right? Okay. So, yeah, I think last month it was, I did a little uh, wee article um, in and around fostering and ad- adoption, basically because the um, Robin Swan had brought through children and adoptions legislation. There was, um, there was stuff getting talked about in the media, which actually wasn't about the legislation, but it was really good timing. And then, yeah, me and my wife have been involved in fostering for about 17 years, I think now. So my, I've, I've two grown up kids of 23 and 21. And we have also fostered in a number of kids, you know, over, over about 17 years when we had our kids. And then um, more recently, then we have taken on three permanents. So they're not foster kids. They're um, they're not adopted either. They're uh, it's called a special guardianship order. So it's as close as you get to adoption. They are our kids um, and will be with us until they're adults. So, wow. You know, yeah. We've just expanded the family. By, we never had three in the house before, except when we were fostering, and, and that, but we never had three to keep, if you know what I mean. So, and how do you find balance in that with like your your workload? Is that is that tricky or? It's it's incredibly tough. Yeah, absolutely. It's really incredibly tough. So, I mean, we always had to do a balance, um, but we always had our own kids too. So, um, you know, for any working family, any any couple or any uh, single person who has a child, if the child is their own or. Um, adopted or fostered or whatever there is uh, there are always challenges so obviously if you're um, my wife works um, she's a nurse and for either of us then you know these kids are young so there's obviously the school but but the reality is that's how families operate today anyway mm-hmm. so you know and we think of these kids very much as our own kids now so um, that's if, if you know if you had two or three kids or a child you, you know you'll know sometimes the impact that that has and, the, and how you have to factor your life around that and adjust. And do you come from, did, did, did your family adopt or did your wife's family adopt or how did you get into it or what was the... No, do you know what? I genuinely don't know the absolute answer to that. I, I will, I will, I'll, I'll defer to that it was, I would, I would imagine it was my wife that, that probably brought the subject up because generally we do what she wants and then we're happy. Um, <laughs> I'd love to be able to say, oh, it was my idea and I saw all these children in need. Well, we did hear about, you know, that there, we, we were aware that there was a need. 
um, you know, there were a lot of children in care and stuff. I, I grew up uh, in the low road in Lisburn and there was a, there was a children's, um, it was called a children's home in, in Glenmore there. So I was always aware of, you know, the kids that came in and out of there and stuff. But neither of our families had any experience. So we were, we were, we were like a, a dry hit at it. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, so presu- presumably, Robbie, then a lot of these kids that um, from back at the start then are probably under their 20s and have probably moved on maybe a fair bit since then so is there any contact or do you ever hear from any of the early ones do you see how they're going uh, un- unfortunately not uh and i mean that i mean that from the bottom of my heart but i would love to know a little bit more about all of them and some in particular and and i spoke about this in the chamber that the very first one that we got a wee boy he was two and a half and we got him and we only we had him for about eight weeks and we saw a, a remarkable transformation in those eight weeks and he was a lovely 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 boy and then we ended up uh, I'll make this a shorter story, but we ended up with his sister about two years later, and we didn't know it was a sister. Well, it turned out when actually when we found out it was a sister, they were the double of each other. So we knew when we saw her, she thought, wow, she looks like somebody we've met before. Um, and, you know, in that family, so that was a family with a lot of trauma and, and difficulties, who, who I think all the kids out of that home then, you know, went into some kind of care. We were privileged to, to spend some time with both of them. And I would love to know what happened, particularly perhaps to those two and all of them now. I think things will change in the future um, and I think it'll, t- it'll change for the better. So for instance, um, this is probably a quite an easy to understand analogy. They, when these kids come to you, um, because of the tr- sort of troubled start they have in life and, 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 and a wee bit of trauma and things like that, they, they, their memories are incredible. So they will remember things right through their life. So we're, I have a big dog, as you probably know anyway, big St. Bernard, and she's lovely. And a lot of these kids have met this big dog and, and you know, would be would have good memories of a big dog, but the way it was set up in the past is that story wouldn't follow them through life. So they would have this memory of a big dog, but they might not be able to place it. You know, where, where, why, why yeah. do I like big dogs or why do I not like big dogs? What is it about big dogs? So now they're developing a, like a story, a story for the kid, you know, for the young people. So that they'll maybe be able to keep like, we, you stayed in a house with Mr. and Mrs. B and they had a big dog called Minnie. You know, and a picture of the dog or something will go, and then that'll help the child. So selfishly, yes, I want to remember, but it's more important that, that those kids that they're get told the truth, um, uh, are enough of the truth is shared with them that they understand what's happening. You know, uh, uh, what, what's the longest period of time you've looked after kids apart from your current um, three children? Um, we, well, probably we probably didn't have any or any kids <clears throat> anymore in about two months. So we did um, mostly short-term emergency and respite and the bulk of that being respite for other foster carers who would do the full-time stuff and that's an incredibly important role because the foster families and there's some incredible foster families about that do infinitely more work than we ever did um, and help uh, a lot more kids and they need to break sometimes maybe either with just as a couple or with their own kids maybe um, you know to do that that other piece so that's a role that people can do so people talk about I'm not going to foster because it takes up too much commitment well you can foster and do as little as maybe a week or two a year you know as wow. if you're there to provide respite for another family but you've been through all the tests and checks why, why would you not why would you not do that you know so and that make, yeah so you can test it out on the smallest of scales to see if it's yeah. for you and then decide to yeah, yeah, yeah. go bigger absolutely um and i would say and genuinely i think it would be a very listen it's it's, it's not easy but it's very rewarding and but i don't think a, like for instance respite stuff so for doing a couple of year, year uh weeks a year it would be beyond too many people you know because uh, it is very rewarding now, sometimes you get sometimes you get a, a child who has maybe slightly more challenging because of the you know background or whatever or, or some difficulties but um the support is getting better you know the support that, that you can get is, is is getting better it's not, not perfect like, but it's getting it's getting there uh, do you think getting involved with fostering has changed your idea of different people's circumstances, um, like in our society? Yeah, I think um, there's no doubt that it has. Um, uh, I would have been, we would have been probably particularly, I've always been in and around the community anyway, you know, in terms of, so I grew up in, in the housing estate and low road and I've always stayed about Lisbon, but even the jobs and my sort of um, pathway, my career pathway has always kept me quite close to, to working with families and, and people and, and, and around people. So I had a good idea, but w- what you probably do see is the, when you see maybe, and you, and you and for this, so the no now, for instance, in Northern Ireland, when we talk about the mental health crisis that we have, okay, that most of that, 
most of the genesis of that will come out of some level of trauma, whether it's the trauma of Northern Ireland and then your parenting that didn't happen, or whether it's the trauma that happened to you as a child or the adverse childhood experiences. Well, kids that you know come from that that background inevitably will have had already sadly a first year of adverse experiences, and then that's really incredible and, and good to know because it helps inform you for how you then respond and um, behave, you know, as as a cur. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I think particularly here in, in Northern Ireland, um, I read previously that uh, trauma can actually uh, change and alter your DNA. So as a result, if you father, mother, children or give birth children, that that actually impacts on your child's DNA. So not only do the environmental factors and the stresses that you probably carry just from the like trauma of a memory, it, it's biological as well as in your words and, and in your um so uh, like in terms of uh, like the rates of mental health issues in northern ireland whether it, whether it be suicide or um whatever i i genuinely believe there is a there's there's a legacy that's of the troubles a mental health legacy as well as you know um our historical and current political um yeah, yeah. There's, there's no doubt. The um, Professor Jim Dorn, who's the late Jim Dorn, who's he's, he's passed away sadly, he spoke on that very issue in a, a, a trauma conference in Belfast a number of years ago. And he was talking about, for instance, um, so you, you're talking about the, 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 the stuff that's passed on and actually even um, reproductively. So if, if, if a woman is in a, a violent relationship, shall we say, and so, that it's, so if you think about the pregnancy and, you know, the wee unborn baby and then maybe the, the abusive environment, and all of those things that are released within a pregnant mom, um, because we, you know, you, you can you, you can understand how smoking would affect and how drinking alcohol and taking drugs. You understand that bit, but it's those neural pathways. And then the, I suppose what they're discovering about the brain is the brain is it's constantly growing, it's constantly evolving. All these neural pathways, but the most important bit is pre-birth and birth and those early years. That's when all the magic happens. Or sadly, sometimes a lot of the darker stuff and not so not so magic. And then that can really sort of chart set the chart but what, but what i would genuinely say is there's this huge uh there's, there's real chance for for better for hope for change if you get a child earlier you get a child out of that environment and into a secure um loving space that the, the magic then can happen and and things will change for the better absolutely and sometimes it's harder than others but it will always change for the better so this idea of like neuroplasticity like the brain will will mold, mold and adapt as a result of that loving environment yeah absolutely mm. so essentially um essentially it's easier to fix a child than it is to fix an adult 100%. and the most crudest of terms well yeah it, it, um listen i'm not gonna start preaching that just but it does it says something in the bible about show me a boy when he's seven i'll, I'll, I'll show you the man um you know yeah. people pick the bible all they want but it's it's it's, it's pretty good and yeah. you know it's an, an any child so um, I, I'm the chatty man now. Well, guess what? When I was seven, I was a pretty chatty guy. I, I can remember being <laughs> quite a bit by my mum and stuff, you know. Um, and you know, if, I, if my wife is really quiet um, outside of the house, she's not so quiet inside the house, but she's very quiet outside the house. And I would say, you know, when she was a child and she was seven, she'd have been a very quiet child, too, you know. So, mm -hmm. but it's really important to see those those early years, see from from even just pre-birth right through till till you know those early primary years. Those are those are the the, the golden years to, to really shape and make it make it make a change and make a difference but we should never stop we should never not you know say, say that there's any cutoff because we all evolve at different stages and times but as you said the neuroplasticity i don't really said that right uh, of our brains is 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 and you know it, 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 mine's still, my brain's still changing <laughs> How, ho hopefully our all our brains are still changing for the better <laughs> <laughs> hopefully um, um. Robbie, one of the things that we, uh, one of the things that we were interested in, or that excited us, was your previous life. Um, you know, your your early career. Um, you know, you started off working as a butcher. How did you get into that, there, Robbie? Um, I, I, I just, I, I was leaving school. I was, I was maybe in fifth year, and I didn't had no career, had no career aspiration. I just wanted to work. Um, and I wasn't doing very well at school, so it, you know, and I just so it didn't have any academic path. Just wanted to work and get a, a few pounds because we didn't have a lot of money back home. And I met someone whose dad owned a butcher shop in Lisburn, and literally they just phoned me one day at home. Didn't have mobiles back in the day, so it was a landline. And I think my mum answered the phone or something, and they said, "Do you think Robert would like?" And they called me Robert back then. 
I would probably do like a job in the, in the butchers. And just, I went in and so whilst I was in fifth year in school, I, did, I worked on Saturdays and then about a few months before I left school, I started going in on an afternoon and then the guy just said, do you want to, do you want to work? Do you want to want a job? And I just said, yeah, I, I literally didn't even think about it. I just was, I'd been offered a job and I was like, yeah. So that was 1988. Um, and I started as a butcher and I was getting 40 pound a week, um, 40 pound a week. And I was working about, I would say between 50 and 60 hours a week easily. Oh. It was, I'm not joking. It, it was, um, that would get you about 20 litres of diesel. Today. <laughs> <laughs> and then 10 litres of diesel tomorrow. <laughs> um, it was, it was, you know, something that was, um, it was really, it was really hard work, but you know, I mean, when I'm talking to any young people today, you know, everything you do in life comes back at you. Uh, you know, every connection you make and every, so I met, so I worked as a butcher for, in Lisburn for many, many years, even when I moved on to the prison and the, and, uh, and the police, uh, prison and then the fire service, I still always kept my hand in making sausages and, and counter work and stuff. But I met literally thousands of people in Lisburn on that counter, thousands, thousands. And, uh, and, uh, and every one of those, like people will vote for me. Um, they'll say, oh yes, you're we Robbie the Butcher. I remember you and you know, you were great and whatever. And the, and the other the, the other flip side of that is if it had been an absolute tube, that I uh, said, yeah. oh, you're, you're Robbie the Tube, not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 like, and so through these shops that I worked in, you know, a family was, were raised through them. So a lot of the, maybe the young girls and young fellas who were coming in as kids, or now I got their own kids and, and I meet them now and again, you know, went into one of the shops last Saturday. I couldn't get out of it. I couldn't get out of it. It was just customer after customer came in and I ended up talking to him, the guy that owns the shop now. I think he was getting a wee bit peeved because we, we were reminiscing about all these stories from about 30 years ago, you know, uh, and it was lovely. It was lovely. Do you ever get, I see, that would stress me. I see, like, um, I'm a teacher, so I would get to meet a lot of people, you know, in the community and whatever else. But the, there's never, like, a greater moment of panic when I see someone out of the context in which I know them, because I will never remember their name. Are you good with that? Are you good with no, people's no, names? No, because I know, I just call, I call you, if I seen you two in this next day, I said, all right, mate. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Tom. And you guys would be going, hi, Robbie. And then I'd be waiting for you to say something like, yes, I, our, we had a podcast with you last week and then I'll go, all right, yes. Yeah, and yeah. then we'll do this, man. So for, for me, and I've met that many people, yeah, I'm really poor with names, guys. Really poor, really, really bad. Um, and I used to get told off in the shop for calling um, uh, the, the women love. I used to say, can I get you anything, love? And then people, used, and I used to say to the guys, just, what can I get to mate? And the odd person used to be offended by that. So sometimes if a woman didn't want me called love, they'd, they'd be told. And, and I had some guy say, I'm not your mate. <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> They'll be as offended as uh, vegetarian voters are. <laughs> Do you want to listen to this? <laughs> They're like, I can't vote for Robbie. <laughs> vote for Robbie because, and, and you know, I actually, the, the job itself um, is a great job. And you know, you can't get a butcher these days, like literally. There's so few butchers about. Um, I mean, there's no butchers in, in, in supermarkets and stuff now because they just get everything in packaged and they slice it. I just call them meat slicers and keep them going. I mean, and, and there is a skill shortage and there's a shortage of butchers. People who can actually own a, a hind quarter, a four quarter, display it, manufacture it, and then do the bit on the counter. You know, it's actually, a, I used to think that it wasn't much of a job because it didn't pay well. See, when I think back, it's actually, a, it's, an, it's an interesting job. Um, and actually, you actually do need to be quite good at what you do and have an understanding of it, you know? Yeah, I think the, the butchers that have survived now, any butcher that I know of, I know of because someone has told me this butcher is really, really good. Yes. Yes. So obviously people just go there and, um, yeah, no, um, talking about, uh, you know, dealing with people, um, do you have trolls on Twitter? I suppose, uh, I suppose being a politician, it's just a guaranteed thing. I, I, I do, okay, and, and I've, I've, so I would, I think I've got, I've identified six people that have been assigned to me, okay, <laughs> um, literally, so I know that there's, there's so no matter, there's a couple of, if I put up stuff, there's a couple, and it doesn't matter what the topic is, they always come in with the same thing, okay, and they're quite political, so right, I, right, know, right. I know the background they're coming from, and I know whatever, and they seem to be assigned to me, but I have got off quite light, because, um, you know, there's like if Doug Beatty or Naomi Long or maybe Carla Lockhart or uh, maybe Michelle O'Neill and, 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 and they get much, much worse. But they, I think they all sometimes get much worse because they punch back <laughs> quite, you know, especially Naomi and Doug, they will, they go on Twitter and they want to, you know, bounce back and, and whatever. I, 
I can't be bothered most of the time. And and mostly, um, almost, I, I really don't like responding to people I don't know. So if, you know, if you're not prepared to put your face and your name on, yeah. I have only responded to like maybe 1% of the people who have responded. Now and again, I'll respond to one of them, I think, it, it's maybe not a troll, it's just someone who isn't prepared to put your face and name to it. I've got to be honest, I don't think you should be allowed to do that on Twitter because it's such a powerful platform now. If it was totally fun, fair enough, but it's not fun. It's such a powerful platform, I think you should have to. If you're going to say something, I think you should have to literally front up and be who you are. Yeah. You know, because politicians are so accessible. You know, we are, and there's nothing special about us, but we're so accessible, but we have families. And we are ordinary people and we're trying to do our best. I was on the education, there was a debate today, a big vote on the integrated education book. And we'll, you know, we'll get critiqued because of what we did. Because here's the thing, everybody was telling us to do the right thing, but the right thing for different people is different things. Yeah. You know, and that's the nature of politics. Um, but Twitter expands that into a real negative, you know, um, and uh, some of the stuff's really rank, you know. Do, do you mind if I ask you about that? I, I teach in an integrated school, so I'm a, I probably have a dog in the race. If you like, um, what was the what was the thinking behind, or what was the justification? And forgive my ignorance, because I genuinely haven't been following it really, really closely. But I, I'm aware of the rough headlines of that you guys, uh, the UUP, weren't weren't for it at this point, at the in the form in which it came in. Yeah, I think it was the poor quality of teachers in integrated schools demo, <laughs> but <laughs> you definitely don't want to put me in that put, uh, put, <laughs> we could live in like a valley for enough. Um, <laughs> right around that house, nobody's against integrated education. But I my, my perception is of that the, the most of us in, in the public who haven't used maybe integrated education believe integrated education to be the primary purpose about it to get good numbers of Protestant and Catholic kids in the same school building being educated together, okay? Now, at the moment, 50% of integrated schools don't meet the targets for, thank you, thank you. Where you going, man? I missed you too. Um, <laughs> so, right, so so when this bill came in, I thought, okay, an integrated education bill, maybe it's going to be ambitious. Maybe it's going to do what it says in the tent and it's going to try and get more kids from a Catholic and Protestant background into more schools and stuff, but it doesn't, what, what the first two clauses do is it dilutes what I believe integrated education is and should be. So it broadens it out to just be reasonable numbers of any kids from any background and including reasonable numbers of Protestant Catholics. So for me, it diluted and brought the integrated education sector very much into where the control sector already is. And that's okay. And that's okay if the control sector wants to do it. I know you're going to probably argue with me, Damien. No, 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 I'm not. But this I'm, is just I'm listening, I'm hearing you out. And then there's a thing, the main bumper was the strategy. So through so throughout this, the state other stakeholders are saying there's finite budgets here, and we, we you know we can't afford to be detrimentally impacted. So I, I spoke to the bill sponsor and, and, and throughout the debates we were told that there would be no detrimental impact, you know, fiscal. So I sought to put an amendment in at the last round, which was basically put it on the face of the bill, there will be no detrimental impact. To you, but they voted against that. Now, if they voted against that, they voted against it for a reason, because they're willing to accept that there might be a detrimental impact fiscally to you know to other schools. Now, I'm not saying that's wrong, but for me, it was it wasn't right. Yeah. So therefore, that was for me that was my red button to say, well, I can no longer support this. Mm -hmm. and, and when the bill is sponsored in a moment, record saying I want we wanted to support it because we do believe educating our children together is, is vitally important. What was shared with me uh, was that the, 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 the bill sponsor wants to move it more towards an ethos as opposed to, so basically I was saying, so if you're from West Belfast, for instance, and you, you live in a, 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 an area which is predominantly Catholic, like 99%, are you going to bus kids to a school, you know, next in bus? No, you're not. You're going to go to the nearest, nearest school. And eventually any school could be an integrated school as long as the ethos is there so therefore you're not for me that doesn't do what we need to do we need children to meet each other in that place and in that space do you know what i mean and so yeah it, it's interesting like i have my own issues with integrated schools in the, in the sense that um i love the idea of integration i think it's really really important and i buy into integration like really wholeheartedly because you know i remember getting to uni and having like maybe one or two Protestant friends because I'm from a Catholic background and it was just crazy like it was just like I remember speaking to like a 
friends in England and they just, it blew their mind. They literally couldn't understand it. And it's like, I'll, I'll do you one better, lads. Like, I don't have any non-white friends either. And they were like, you know. <laughs> well, like, you only had two friends, Timo. <laughs> 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 <that. laughs> I'm starting to think I need better friends, Karen. <laughs> the, the bill, Damien, is, you know, the bill has, the bill inevitably has some good in it. I think there's parts of it just we couldn't, just don't work and the minister wrapped it up incredibly well there are things there are unintended consequences with the bill which is going to make it very difficult for integrated schools now to operate actually i mean it was incredible stuff towards the end of the debate to listen into but i do believe the bill sponsored at the start of it their intentions were good and you know but this is the thing about politicians we get labeled with all sorts of stuff and most of the ones that i have met are actually decent people you know i genuinely it's it's just a strange arena to be operating in yeah, it, the thing I find um, interesting about integrated schools is integrated doesn't necessarily mean integrated. Integrated just means Christian, but Christian Catholic or Christian Protestant. So it, it's really interesting that in, like when you when you think of the word integrated, I think of like kind of all religions or and none. Yes. Um, but it's interesting that we don't do that here in Northern Ireland. We have so there's, there's also, I mean, there were, there were, there was a couple of uh, amendments offered up by the humanists for the for the integrated bill to take faith out of schools completely. Mm -hmm. So there is um, there is a, a growing uh, a growing um, community, if you like, who just want to strip all Christian faith, all faith, not just Christian faith, but all faith out of school. Now they will dress it up and say, ah, we well, don't mind a wee bit of RE taught. But what they actually want in that isn't RE taught. They want a, a new curriculum that actually probably promotes humanism as much as anything. And, and, and from their perspective, that might be fair. I come, I, I've been a, a Christian since I was eight and I've, I'm very strong in my faith. I don't ram it down anybody's throat, but I do see the good in it. Um, and, um, you know, when I went in 2018 to Dublin to see the Pope, I got a lot of stick from uh, predominantly probably those, some people in my own community. Um, and when I, when I came back and was interviewed, they, they asked me about it. And I'd said, um, when I went down, I went down as a, a Christian Protestant unionist. When I came back up, guess what? I was still a Christian Protestant unionist. It was fine. It was actually very good. It was a great experience. Um, there, there was nothing to fear. And unfortunately, we're all so fear. Wherever we're back, our background is, it's like demons over there. They're, they're looking yeah. to change, they're looking to get at you, they're looking to do you, and you're going like, oh my, stop it, yeah, come on. But, you know, it's it's all like, you talk about propaganda. Now, this, I mean, this place has been propaganda city for decades. Um, radicalization, this place has been radicalizing kids for decades. You know, we, we you look at those far off countries across in Afghanistan, and you see young kids and stuff, and you think it's been, they were radicalized here, and some, unfortunately, in some instances, they're still being radicalized. I, like I, what I find really interesting is that we have two different communities and the, um, I have friends from both sides of the community and I've, uh, what I notice is that their histories are different. We all, we all share the same history, but mm -hmm. the, the history uh, from, from my Protestant friends is different from the history from my Catholic friends. And it's like, there doesn't seem to be same thing, but like, a, like a factual meeting in the middle real. kind of... There was so uh, there will be interesting, and I think it would be quite revealing if anybody was able to ever write an absolutely, and I mean absolutely un, un uh, indoctrinated story, and all of us will squirm. Everybody will squirm. Yeah. Everybody. Everybody yeah. will squirm. Um, because in Italy, the, 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 we have we have jails all over the world in all countries full of people who do things. It's, we're not unique here. We we have people who uh, had a greater propensity to do stuff. We have people who were radicalized. Um, where people who genuinely did things and they thought they were doing it out of the, you know, they were just so convinced that it was right. But we also had evil people doing bad things. I mean, yeah. some of the stuff, when you read through the books and you, you, you realize, you know, you see how people were actually brutalized. Mm -hmm. Not just somebody was killed, but the brutal manner in which people were killed reveals something much more dark, much more sinister. But that exists everywhere. It exists in Dublin, it exists in Manchester, it exists in London. We have it, and we call it bigotry and sectarianism over there. It's it's it's, it's uh, uh, racism or sexism or whatever, and it's man's inhumanity to man. Mm. Um, you know, and and uh, so, but what I think we need to do is from look at what we've done actually since 1998 in particular, um, and there's been I mean huge huge strides, um, and sometimes we we forget that and we neglect actually that um, this is a contested space and you know, there's no doubt, there's no need for anybody to say anything different. For me, there is a solution, there will be a solution. 
and it won't necessarily just be Robbie Butler's solution, but it has to be done through dialogue and you know and, and agreement. And we do have a space and a place here that is is, is worth sharing. Um, you you guys um, would reach the hand of friendship a bit over the a bit more over the island, perhaps the DV wouldn't. It? I think that's fair to say. I don't think it too much flack for that. But um, yeah, like uh, particularly, uh, it was quite notable that uh, you had the the G, the kids playing GAA in your um, your literature and your um, uh, campaign um, literature. Did you yeah. did you get any flack for that or yeah yeah or, or was it? yeah yeah we we, we did um, so. I mean, Doug particularly is very strong in the, on this union of people. And, you know, our, our party conference was actually really good. Um, we had a play on. It was a challenging play to watch at the end. It wasn't shown, you know, publicly, I don't think. Brilliant play at about the time of the creation of Northern Ireland or partition, whatever way you want to look at it. It was incredible because even as a unionist, Protestant background, you're listening to some challenging narrative. But similarly, you'd been listening to a challenging narrative from a, 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 a nationalist, a Catholic perspective. We did. We had Irish dancing, we had Scottish dancing, and we had we had different things on there. And we did the, and and that was, and it wasn't to suggest that everybody needs to go out and start playing Gaelic or playing. But what I was saying, it's absolutely right and proper that if you want to, you can you should. Now, the, the, on the on the other hand, the GAA still need to do more. Um, to to um, like obviously there was there would have been a lot of negative stuff coming back last week after. There was a, a memorial that Miss Michelle O'Neill was at the memorial in the GA ground. I mean, that that would set things back inextricably. You know that that's 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 just it's just uh, fundamentally wrong. Um, I, I think it, you know the sporting venue and stuff. And um, but equally, I'd be against a, a, a shrine to anybody that'd be involved in in you know terrorism running in any sports ground, football, rugby. It's just it's just not right. So, but yeah, we did get stuck about it. Um, uh, but you, you said about, you know, we're gen, we don't come across as the DUP, and that's good because I am a politician because of the DUP. So if anybody asks me, why did you get into politics, that big part of it is because of the DUP. Because um, I've said to you, um, I, I have a, a, a strong faith, that's my most important thing. And I was looking at politicians, and I love Northern Ireland, and I was looking at politics, and I never thought I'd leave the fire brigade, but I want Northern Ireland to work, and I looked at the politicians who are supposed to represent me. And I always quite liked the All Students Party, but I wasn't a member or anything quite like them. But looked at the DP and 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 what disappointed me was those were the people who were supposed to be Christians. They're supposed to be, you know, the born again Christians and stuff. And I thought, well, I'm a I'm a born again Christian, I'm a unionist, but I don't like the way they're talking, I don't like that message, I don't like that vibe. And I thought, well, they're not they're not representing me. Um I I'll maybe give it a go. And uh, I chose another vehicle, which was the Austin News Party. It's not a Christian party. Um, there are Christians in the party, like myself. So uh, the difference is, um, I think the DP purport to be a Christian party, but and I don't think I don't see I don't see a whole lot of it in it. Yeah. Know, apart from taking stances on things like abortion and things like that, that's 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 a given for anybody. It's maybe pro-life and stuff, but that's not exclusive to Christians either, in a way. You know, they don't own that ground. Um, but but for me, it's it's like how the message comes out. So it isn't a, because we all have different messages, right? That's not the important. Part isn't trying to get anybody onto your message. The important is how you deliver and share your message. For me, that's the that's the piece. Um, and and you may not agree with me, but if I can deliver it with courage, confidence, and you can believe me, and we can respectfully agree or disagree, I think that does so much more than than trying to break everything with a hammer. No, that's it. Like I'd be an alliance voter, and would be g- genuinely that. That's the kind of politics I'm interested in. Hey, Kieran, Kieran, me and you, me and you are talking next. Damien's off his lantern. <laughs> hey, Damien, Damien's nailed his his flight to the mast on everything here today. Put his heart out for my podcast. <laughs> I've always said to Damien, there's nothing more entrenched than an alliance voter. <laughs> oh boy, I just call him strong. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we had Naomi, we had Naomi, Naomi Long on the last um the last episode we did, and I think I think it was the ginger hair connection they had. <laughs> oh, they'll have clicked here, Karen. You won't have had this head much anyway when Naomi on. <laughs> she'll, have, <laughs> she'll, she'll have filled all the spaces. <laughs> I know we had a long list of questions, and like we got like one question in, <laughs> like the, just a whole you page know, of questions like we didn't ask. She's an impressive woman. She, oh, she's uh, unbelievable. I'm really. I don't get I genuinely just don't get some of the politics. I genuinely don't. Um, I, I find I don't I don't know if Naomi's driving this. Remember when I was on a Nolan show one night and I think it was Nolan McAllister was on and the question was it's time to end orange and green politics and Nolan was very strong. I find it very offensive. 
I found it a very offensive statement. Um, because for me, where the alliance were many years ago, where the, the, the party that put a hand out each side and didn't say anything about anybody and brought everybody together and said, you're good and you're good and we're going to meet in the middle. And I love that space. But now it's time to end the orange and green politics. And, and not saying that's duty, but I get the vibe that everything's the fault of uh, orange and green. Orange and green for me is what they're saying is nationalism and, and unionism. And then the, this middle ground elevates themselves above as opposed to just being the people in the middle and bring it all together, you know? So I don't know if that is actually the way it is. That's how it's perceived, and that's how it, make, that's how it makes me feel at times. Yeah. You know? And and I know for, listen, Chris Little would be not on that page. Chris Little is a fabulous, I, I seriously miss Chris Little. He's the chair of the education committee, so I know Chris isn't in that space. However, there definitely are people in that space, um, and more so, I think. Um, and listen everybody can have their position um and the uh, lads are very vocal at the minute in sharing their position yeah yeah um kieran i just want to touch back on something because kieran and i spoke about this actually last week and we'd have different views on the um on the that shrine on the, on the really? GAA grounds <laughs> uh we yeah did, did you want to add anything to that kieran or you, is, if you don't want to talk about it either that's uh, fine no, too. Well, well we well we argued about the GA ground and we kind of um it was more about in terms of we looked at that space, but then we says, but then that memorial wouldn't have been welcomed in say a main town square. So I suppose in terms of the family of them, they thought, well, where where would it where would it be welcome? And they were members, and then obviously it became political whenever you know local politicians came to unveil on that, and then that brought it into the the political sphere. Um, but then obviously accept Robbie's point as in they were kind of um, looking at the GA as as a cr potential cross community body and then the the kind of situation that that that's that event had um, <laughs> left the GA open to criticism the challenge I would have is that it's a publicly funded sports and like you rightly said um, Kind of maybe impacts on the cross community element that the GAA as a body is trying to promote. Yeah, well, I think the I think the yeah. point I argued with you, Damien, and I just enjoy arguing with Damien on anything <laughs> really, is that well, I suppose regardless, like um, if you would be against it, um, does everybody deserve a memorial does anybody deserve a memorial and where do you put them do you put them on places that are public places um or somewhere where they would be only wholly accepted by the immediate surrounding community you know so we i i just i would suggest in, in those instances it would it's they're only fitting in around the, the, own, the community where it's where it's it's champion because and so if you I mean a sports ground people it's a public space people will visit or be expected or reasonably expected to visit so for instance a school wouldn't be a, a, a place or a public park or somewhere where you would expect someone to go i mean when i played football um we used to play against the teams that used to come off they were just finishing i think maybe the gaelic season or something they were incredibly fit at the start of the season and stuff and we went all over the blanking country to play and and you know at times um but my team was probably mostly pro I think maybe we'd only maybe one or two Catholics that played for us. It was just, it wasn't deliberate. It was just one of those things. I live in a place and went to school like that and stuff. But we went to places where we were packed out as a broad team, you know, and it was, it was, it was tight going. I, it really was tight going. Um, got, you know, and the same would have happened in return, but we didn't dish it out. We, we punched in the head, kicked around football pitches and all sorts of stuff when people assume, well, we didn't take anything with us. We didn't have any, we didn't wear red, white and blue kit and, and, you know, and things. So, but, and then if you're going into a, a, a space that has something like that too, uh, I mean, I mean the, 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 the fear that that would generate and, and, and for some people, the anger too. And so I, so I do accept that there's a story and a narrative there for the family. However, um, that, that's, that's where it is. That's, that's kind of in the community. Um, and, but there's a, obviously the FIC commission was, was put together to, to deal with all this stuff. So there are, there are probably hundreds of unofficial memorials around the country. Weren't they, weren't they trying to do something like a wasn't a, a memorial or like a, a troubles museum or whatever around the maze? Was that is that right? They, they were trying to do something like that, and um, and that was to go with the maze stadium and stuff, you know. Um, and the maze stadium would have been brilliant because the maze stadium. Oh yeah, I mean like in Ballin Court, I wanted it, but the maze stadium would have been a central stadium for basically a national stadium for uh, football, rugby, and Gaelic. 
you know, and it would have been in an area which isn't a nationalist area, you know, for the Gaelic, for instance, but geographically and arterially brilliant to get to. Um, and it had the space and stuff, but then it fell down over the inability to agree a, a narrative, as I suppose, for what the memorial piece would look like, given that it was the H blocks there. Um, and that would have been difficult for me from my background. I worked in the prisons for, for a number of years, so I, I understand the, the, how hard that is to, to, you know, you've got the perspective of prisoners and people that were, you know, um, interned. And then you've got the, the, the staff, and I know what it's like for the staff. You know, and, and there was 30, I think there's 33 prison officers murdered over the years. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a, a former teacher of mine. His father was a prison officer. His name is George Foster, and he was murdered by the IRA outside uh, Buffs Club. Um, uh, he worked in the Crumlin Road jailhouse. Um, so he's actually coming on the podcast. He's going to talk a bit about his experience, but um, he's a pretty amazing guy, like not a sectarian bone in his body, despite the well, you know unbelievable something? tragedy. Well, it's, it's, this is the, the interesting thing, and Carol McKillen from Sinn Féin described me in about a couple of months ago, was probably the, one of the least sectarian politicians in there. She said something like, there's not a sectarian bone in your body. And I'm working in there, and I was a prison officer, and I was under threat because it was pre ceasefire I was 1996 to 2000. And, and you know, if Jerry Kelly is across, and, you know, I, I speak to Jerry Kelly. Jerry Kelly is obviously very notorious in terms of his, his background stuff and Pat Sheehan and different ones. And I, I talk to him and, and, and work with him because that's politics and, and I genuinely don't have any hatred. Um, I, I don't like what happened. I don't like and I don't agree with the, the, the narrative that they have at all. I really don't. And I worked in the blinking place, so I have a, bit of a, have a wee bit of understand. But I understand too that they come from a different background and were brought up with something different than I was. And, and you know, everybody's truth is slightly different. Um, but what I'm saying is I'm not interested. I, I am cons- I'm not... Um, I remember the past. But I'm using it as as a benchmark to do something a whole lot better. Yeah, suppose that is very much what Doug's trying to do in terms of the Union of People stuff too. You know, we're we're not forgetting about the past. We're not saying it didn't happen. What we're saying is like, you know, we have competing narratives here. Everybody needs to be entitled to tell the truth. However, my kids and these kids that I'm looking after, this is more important that we get it right for you know for the next generation that's coming through and learn from maybe the mistakes of my generation. Yeah. I'm 50 this year, so. People, a lot of people my age were involved in things, you know, or suffered, you know. If you're born post-1998, all you've got is the stories, really. And you remember we talked about, we talked about, this started about this, about the adverse childhood experiences and trauma. Well, I suppose even the post-ceasefire babies still have that trauma coming through, but they don't understand it in the same way. So you can't, so perhaps, and, and it's maybe worse for them, because there's this wee um, thing I, I learned in the fire service sometimes, you will suffer less trauma if you're at the very front of an incident and you see the stuff and you're trying to help. Sometimes the people that are trying to help but can't get close enough and don't see, it's worse for them because they're playing out things that they don't even see and they're imagining things that be worse than actually is happening or have that, um, uh, re- there's a regret syndrome that you think you could have done more or you think you should have done something different, but actually, you know, and, and so, the, and I think a lot of the post ceasefire um, people that have come through um, carry some of that yeah that's interesting yeah, yeah. that the the ones on the, the periphery can almost be suffering a bit more than the ones who are in the cold face yeah mm-hmm. what was it like then um on the prison service uh robbie like i mean you must have had some interesting days <laughs> hard it was hard it's it's you know it's really the most under under um appreciated um uh roles it's it's, it's hard every day um, that was brilliant. The camaraderie is excellent. I would go as far as to say the camaraderie in there is better than it is in the fire service because you're not competing with each other. You really need to have each other's back every day. And it's a challenging environment. Um, and yeah, back in the day, I met some like some of the most high profile people of the day, you know, coming through, whether they were visiting other people, whether they were in. And it was chilling, let's just say. <laughs> some of it was quite chilling. Um, but they do, have, they do a great job, you know, um, they're looking after people every day. So it's not just all about just keeping people locked up. It really isn't. And it wasn't even back in the 90s. It really was. I mean, there's workshops down there and, and you'll know this anyway, even in 70s and 80s. Some of the, 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 the guys particularly came out with incredible, incredibly educated, you know, too. Um, so there's different narratives set, told about the prison. Some of it's romantic and some of it's quite brutal. And the truth is probably somewhere in between. Did you have any interactions with dissidents or anything? Um, with dissidents, dissident prisoners, when you were in your during your time there, there were no dissidents at that time. Um, that time, that time you you had the um the, the 
bigger players at that time probably were um, um, the LVF um, and INLA were probably quite active at that time and um, and the Provo still a bit, but less so. Um, so those were maybe the, the main protagonists at that stage. Um, so there, I don't think I can't don't think the dissidents were about at that stage. Um, there was uh, there was most of them coming through were treated you okay. And just we're, we're, we're dead on. I, I, I'll be honest. Again, I wasn't directly abused by any any of them. I didn't really, uh, you know, we, every every person else was under threat. Um, but m most come through just by the time of day. And Are you ever see in like Sweden and the, these Scandinavian countries, they almost have these like open door kind of prisons where it, it like you know there's like two prison guards, two members of staff to every you know, inmate, and it's all really investing in the person. So, it, you know, it's, psych it's psychological counseling, it's giving them responsibilities of looking after animals. It's kind of this, it's a really holistic kind of way of and engaging. And then when they get out of prison, it's like, they, it's like it's in stages. So they go to like these uh, managed apartments where someone checks in them every day. They have all these different mentors around and they get them into different lines of work to see what works for them. And it's like a guaranteed job and a huge amount of investment, but they worked out. It was still cheaper to do that than it was to arrest the people, bring them through the court system and all, you know, all the, because the, the recidivism, I can never say that word, but you know, you know what I want about. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. So it's, um, it's the reoffending, the, the, the reoffending rate goes down. So, so we, for us to get there, and it is the right, it is a really good model. For us to get there, we would need a societal change over about 20 or 30 years because the, the Swedish mentality is different to the Northern Irish mentality, and our mentality is quite into us. You know, we, 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 we're, we're quite a unique people, shall we say. So the, the, there's no doubt that it works, and there have been steps here. For instance, the Young Offender Centre is no longer called the Young Offender Centre. It's called High Bank College Wood. And, uh, and they, they have a model which is, it's not like that. It's not that, but it's like that, and they have moved... Um, and there's been some resistance to it because, again, you've got that cultural stuff, but actually it, it's shown to um, reduce the reoffending rate. Now, they did, what you really need is real investment in the early year stuff. So, um, and, the, and the younger you can get that, and you need to prevent people from getting in. If they go into the Young Offender Centre, reduce the reoffending there. And eventually, in five and ten years, you'll see the fruit of that because it's harder to stop someone from reoffending if they're an, an old player, you know, an old timer, um, like me. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, so, I. Well, I, I I've always thought but that the public I mean I mean just talking about you know your regular prisoners now not talking about like political prisoners of the past but you know in terms of like crime and punishment now they're always I think that's what I see is that the public seem to want punishments more prominently than rehabilitation like they want the person punished and if they become rehabilitated, rehabilitated, then fine. But punishment first, and rehabilitation second. You know, like I mean, there's. I think I would say, like looking at England's, you know, which I think has become more and more right wing. Like they're leaning very heavily towards punishments. You know, where a lot of a vast portions of the Tory Party back the reintroduction of, you know, um, capital punishments, and that's you know. So I think that's. Could you really change the prison system if public opinion is so firmly behind punishment of individuals? So, so that's why I was saying you need you need the societal change too. You, you know, they, they don't happen um, uh, don't happen in tandem. And I don't think even in Sweden anybody was ever elected on a ticket of saying we're going to invest hundreds of millions of pounds or billions of pounds into rehabilitation because that wouldn't have got you elected in Sweden either. No. So, for instance, the probation board do great work, and the probation board, um, it's, it's very difficult work. They, they do the rehabilitation, and they do the training, they do the support. But yet, no, it's so easy to vilify them. It's so easy, you know, because the person that they're trying to help maybe did something particularly grotesque or bad or whatever. You ask people the question, do you want them to be rehabilitated? And it will be 100% yes. But what does that investment look like? And I mean, it's I mean, very emotive things to talk about, you know, say when you go to prison to get punished, but actually you probably have quicker access to healthcare. Better access to healthcare, quicker access to dentists, better access to dentists. You'd likely to have a TV in your room. You have access to a gym. Um, and people will say, but they're locked up quite a bit. But most of the time, they're not, actually. It's a, re it's a regime, yes. But for other people, then, the removal of your liberty is punishment enough, too. You know, so it, it's, 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 uh, it's, 
it's not an easy one to fix, but it's 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 um. So you need to, you need to bring your society along with you, but accept that some people can't be and won't be changed as well, and some people do deserve and, and do need to be given a chance and whatever. But eventually, you, part of it is the punishment. To be fair, as well, I mean, punishment is fair. Uh, we, yeah. It's, so it's getting the balance. Um, I was going to say, Demo, will we ask some of these quick fair questions that we asked everyone? Um, yeah, yeah. That we just have a list, um, just we see. So we have a list here, and we've asked everyone uh, so far, Robbie. They're just like little quick fair ones, like so. Um, favorite place to visit in the island of Ireland? So it can be anywhere, north or south, or one of each. Favorite place to visit? Yeah. Uh. Let me think. Let me think. Let me think. Uh, well, I, you know, something. There's something about Bangor. Um, Bangor. I love Bangor because my Sunday school trips used to be to Bangor, and that was my summer holidays. Sun, a Sunday school trip. And the fine weather. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <By the beach. laughs> um. So, following on from that, favorite holiday destination? Obviously, somewhere overseas. Best place I've ever been was the Maldives. Oh wow! Nice. Wow. It was. It was amazing. I like Bangor, but different <laughs> <laughs> when it was land on the beach i thought it wasn't banger in the picky field you know <laughs> um voting rights for 16 year olds yes or no yes uh favorite tv show at the minute picky blinders nice. nice i think that they've just started the last series of that haven't they yep you know, I suppose you look like you could be a character if you if you had the hat. <laughs> like, <laughs> we get a number one round here, you know. And <laughs> you're on that you're on that age demographic who enjoy yeah. wearing those caps to the bars and <laughs> feeling trendy. Well, I'm just waiting. On, I'm waiting on someone to walk into the assembly like your wee man Healy Ray from the Doyle, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Eh? <laughs> He's a colourful lad. Uh, um, favorite local musician. Oh, um, it'd have to be um, uh, uh, Guy Lightbody, Snow Patrol. Nice. Uh, Favourite movie? Got two. We'll have to go for two, guys. Okay, so Wonderful Life, uh, Christmas time. That's absolutely, uh -huh. absolutely adore it. And I didn't realise until more recently, I've watched it a hundred times about the mental health piece in it and, and the suicide piece and, you know, and, and, and the, the, the level of the, the message of hope at the end. And then I absolutely adore The Greatest Showman as well. Oh, yeah. You, yeah, Hugh Jackman's great now. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, bless Thank us. you, Robbie. Yeah. All right. Take and care. Well, bless Thank bye. you. Bye, bye, bye. All the best, Robbie. Bye-bye.